want to get started pretty close to the time, aware that your time is important and we don't have too much time to spend. Normally we would do this over a series of meetings, a series of weeks, but today we just want to give an introduction to our system and tomorrow I'll come back to provide a little bit more information about how that relates more specifically to the chickens. So the format for today will be that we will um, go ahead and spend about 45 minutes to do a presentation around some of the basics of our regenerative poultry system and some of the values and principles that stand behind that. And then at the end, to have about 15 minutes for questions or discussion, if people wish. And I will remain on the line another 30 minutes after the hour for those that might wish to have a further discussion. Um, so I just wanna make sure that I'm getting everybody in here that's joining our call. Um, so as I understand, there's about eight of us that are in the room at the moment. So, so I guess we might as well um, go ahead and get started. Um, but just thank you for joining us. Perhaps I should begin by introducing myself. Um, you know, my name is Bob Kell. I'm a training director with Main Street Project here in Northfield, Minnesota. Um, we've been working on this system over the past 10 years or so, trying to, to design and to experiment with a model that we also wish to share with others. Um, so that what we share today is some of the beginnings of what that thinking has been that's formed the design that we've come up with. And we hope that we'll be able to give you some information that'll be useful to you. I would begin by uh, doing this principally in a PowerPoint format. So we'd like to share my screen so that we can follow that PowerPoint together. So if I can get to the right place here. Um, Okay, so, so this will be um, the system that we, what we call our system is a poultry centered regenerative agriculture model. And hopefully as we talk through this, you'll get to see why we call it that. Um, I know that many of you from around the country have contacted us with questions by email or by phone about how you might be able to apply this model in your situation. Um, I think that's one thing we wanna keep in the background today for everybody to realize that though we use this in, in Minnesota and the Northern Midwest, where there's certain issues around climate and cold that we have to take into consideration. Um, it's also one that you know, certainly can be applied in many different places. The important thing is for you to have a sense of what your own situation, your own ecosystem is, not just in terms of climate, but also in terms of, of the market, the access to processing, the access to the inputs that you need, all of which will affect the way that you're able to implement this yourself. But those things are certainly possible, uh, just can take some different research to find out where those things are. Um, but it's a, a model that has been used in many different places around the world um, because it seems like everybody likes to eat chicken. So Main Street Project, who are we and what is our mission? Our mission is basically that to advance a resilient agriculture system that can demonstrate the power to heal our lands. We know that we have issues with our soil, our, our water, our climate. And we're looking for a system can, that can restore the health of those systems rather than one that 
has negative impacts upon them. We wish to nourish our communities, aware that everybody needs to have access to healthy food, that all people have a right to, to healthy food security. So we work to include others and to include those who sometimes have that access limited in the work that we do. We also work to prepare aspiring beginning and immigrant farmers to share this model with others who have a passion to be able to participate in farming and sort of pass on a knowledge to them, not all of which is ours. Many of this comes from people that for many centuries have been raising birds and doing farming. We just wish to bring that back to the fore. Um, let's make sure everybody's getting in here. So um, as we do that, I'd like to, to share with you a short video about our farm. This farm we acquired uh, about three years ago, a hundred acre farm in which we're trying to put into practice some of the regenerative practices that we've been speaking about and, and experimenting with. Um, it's a piece of land that needs, that was a corn and soy field for many years. And so we've worked hard to bring cover cropping, um, to begin to work with the water, to find out what that wishes to teach us about the land. And I begin to set up some of the structures that we will need to include poultry and other animals as well on this piece of property. We've also planted 11,000 hazelnuts as part of our commitment to perennial agriculture uh, and to what restoration that can bring to the land with its diversity as well. So I invite you to watch this short video. Um, this gives you a sense of what's being underway. So as you see from the video, um, there's a lot of diversity returning to the land, birds and insects and flowers and bees. Um, so that's part of, I guess, the purpose of regenerative agriculture, to restore that kind of balance in our ecosystem. The reason that we began to move in this direction was the awareness of how stressed our land was, how stressed our system was in terms of of our farmers, our, our food, what we were doing to our environment. Some of those things happened because there was a commitment on the part of conventional agriculture to face a real issue. There was a need to produce much and to feed many, but some of the choices that were made, though they were very effective in doing that, also had some consequences. So that had led to genetic modification of seeds to the extensive use of herbicides and pesticides to control insects and weeds. 
led to the movement toward a monoculture, figuring that the efficiency of growing the same thing in hundreds of acres was somehow preferable when you're trying to feed a very large world. And animal production became to be done in confinement because it was more efficient that way, but yet the consequences for the humane treatment of the animals and the consequences also for the land with that, uh, those concentrations of, of manure and figuring out ways to manage that, but also eventually affected also the quality of the food. So already for many, many centuries, I mean, people have had other ways of doing this. In recent decades, there's been a movement toward looking back to some of those alternatives. So the organic movement was looking at how to do this without synthetic uh, inputs, to try to use the natural systems of the earth. The holistic view was looking at restoring the spiritual connection that we need to have to the land and the land to us. In a sense, re remembering to ask permission before we plant and to say thank you for the harvest. The regenerative movement is much in the same, in the same vein, trying to restore a harmony, realizing that there's a diversity that is healthy for the land, that there's a way not just to sustain by inputting more, but to let the, the land restore itself by doing things that are healthy for it. And that will be healthy also for us. So some of the principles that are behind the work that we've done are these, that it be actually good for the land, regenerative for the environment, humane for the animals and the treatment that it be profitable and fair for the worker. Um, realizing that many farmers have very difficult tasks, hard hours, but not always a lot of return for the work that they do, including for our immigrant, immigrant workers, uh, or really a backbone to our agricultural system in this country. So what's a way to give kind of control and ownership to a wider group of people in terms of the land that we own and farm. If we wish to restore rural communities that with the loss of the family farm were deeply affected. We want to have a product that's good for consumer health, raised in a healthy way. And we want to contribute to the security of community food that all have access to what they need. So with that said, let us get to look at the model that we use for raising these chickens. The basics of the system are built around something like this design. We have a stationary coop um, that you know, can have many forms and we'll look at that a, a bit later. But the coop is what provides the nighttime shelter for the birds and shelter from the weather. The important thing is that it be large enough to provide humane space for the birds, um, moving much beyond what is cage free or just in building confinement, but intended to be free range access for the birds, for all the birds all day long, if they wish in, an, in a very well-managed paddock. The coop is built with a, uh, 1.3, um, or rather, sorry, one square foot per bird. That is, um, trying to see if I need to admit this person, sorry. <laughs> um, looking at, yeah, one square foot, foot per bird so that people have uh, so the, the chickens have sufficient room to move about and to rest. Um, for, so for a flock of 1,500 birds, which is the basic of what we use, that means allowing 1,500 square feet at least within that coop that is built. 
But an important part of the design is the paddock itself. Um, we use what is called rotational grazing, dividing the paddock in half so that the birds can first graze on one part. And as that is eaten down, there's time to they're moved to the other side. Well, this side has a chance to regenerate and is re-sown with new seeds for the, so that there will be fresh sprouts when the chickens come back. The paddock has a basic base of a, a perennial pasture mix of grasses that keeps cover crop up, upon the land so that it is not bare ground. For the chickens that bare ground is not so healthy allows for the development of a lot of bacteria and other problems for their health. So keeping it covered is very beneficial for them. Then upon to the part of that paddock is the realizing that chickens do come from originally from a more um, canopied environment, whether it be jungle or, or other wooded areas. Um, the idea is to be able to restore some of that natural habitat. We've chosen to do so with the in introduction of hazelnuts and elderberries, because those are things that are indigenous to our area, and also which have been found to be very symbiotic with the chickens. They absorb a lot of the nitrates from the chicken manure, and they are able to absorb that before it reaches the groundwater. And for the chickens, they provide protection. They pro provide um, shade that keeps the ground cooler and allows the re-sprouting of those, of those grains. And it also provides for the farmer another source of income through the nuts that are produced after a few years. So we found that, that this has worked very well and it, we'll talk more about that as we go. Um, but because it takes about five years for those hazelnuts to develop, in the meantime, we use annual plantings of corn or sunflowers that are able to provide some of that same benefit. So the chickens are rotated out here, spend, when spend the first 30 days in the coop, are then rotated out here for the remaining 40 days or so of their life. Um, spend about seven to 10 days on each side and are rotated back and forth, perhaps uh, you know, three times, three, four times of rotation during the life of a flock. Also, there can be an over canopy of some other uh, heritage trees, some oaks, maples, poplars that can provide some other shade um, and just become part of building a natural diverse habitat for the birds. So here we've mentioned some of these standards the inner, inside the coop, but also outside for 1500 birds, we use an acre and a half, 40 square feet, feet per bird, 20 feet each side. Um, we started with much smaller paddocks, but we found that the birds would often overgraze them and there'd be a lot of bare ground that would be left. But we've moved toward a lot more management of the paddock and have found that to be beneficial for the birds and has become a stronger part of our design. So what is important is that free range access during any months where it's possible to do that, that established canopy, and also a lot of attention to a healthy environment. So it's looking for ways to control and manage the heat, the ventilation, keeping the environment inside the coop dry and making sure that there's protection for the birds. Some of the ways that that paddock is important also is that it becomes forage and a place where they can look for insects, um, scratch in the ground, feed on the, the sprouts and the grasses and weeds that grow there, as well as on the concentrated feed that they are fed. Where it's a place where they feel protected enough that they can live a stress-free life. It needs to be sized big enough so it's sufficient for the number of birds that are in your flock. For 1500, we mentioned 
acre and a half. If you have a smaller flock, say 500, you could get by with a half acre. So not needing a lot of land, but needing to manage it well with that rotation. To establish that, we start out with perennial grasses in a mix. Here's an example of the one that we used on our farm. Mixture of ryegrass, fescues, chicory, clover. Um, reason being that it's something that's good, good and resistant to the colder climate that we live in and to the type of soil that we have. You may find that there are other things that are used in your area that would work better. Remembering that the chickens are not ruminants, they're not like cows and sheep that basically feed themselves off of this grass. Um, they will eat it down, they will trample it down, but it does not provide the main nourishment that they need um, you know, for their protein and their growth, but it can certainly contribute to that and has that advantage of helping to protect and rebuild the soil. The other part of that is the perennials that are planted. Um, once that pasture has had a chance to root out well for a couple of months, then the pasture can be planted with the perennials. We plant them in, in rows spaced about 20 feet apart. Um, that provide some room in between for the sprouting of other grains and movement of feeders and whatnot. But the idea is to get about 50% coverage so that there is enough shade and protection from overhead predators like hawks and eagles. Um, and that it, it keeps it as a cool environment, you know, if it's warm. Find it best to let those, we do grow them from seed, eventually, from the nut eventually, um, but we do keep them in a, a nursery outside of the paddock for a year or so, so that they have a chance to grow to two, three feet. Uh, there's a lot of chicken pressure on them when they're first planted, so that extra size helps. And this shows the importance of the annual sprouts, um, the annuals and the sprouts. Again, here the, the sunflowers are serving as that coverage that the chickens need. And here there's the room for those new sprouted grains that are sown every time we do rotation. It is these that the chickens love to eat, and this does provide good nourishment for them. Because once the, the grains, the seeds do pre-germinate, um, there's a release of enzymes, and those nutrients become more accessible than the dry, dry grain is able to provide. So, so there's a lot of attention done to what we do outside here for the birds, as well as just the concentrated feed. And this is a picture of a paddock that, um, that was developed over about 10 years, where you see that those, those rows of trees have grown pretty well. In some places, still developing more. But this provides a good environment for, for the birds to be free-ranged. Um, let's see. I want to just see if you can see this or not, but this is also a more simple example of what we've talked about. Um, here is a kind of the way the paddock is laid out as that first design showed visually, but this was some rows of, of trees that are planted and that under cover of the basic pasture with the coop. Uh, a fenced in paddock of about 200 by 300 feet. Um, the fence five feet high, strong enough to keep out predators more than to keep the chickens in. But that's kind of the basic model that we use for production. So we'll go back to our PowerPoint. So talking about that basic system of what the, the unit looks like, there's certainly a lot of other questions related to how to set up a poultry business. And any planning has to start, of course, with the market. Um, before you take the trouble to grow the birds, you need to know that you're going to be able to sell, sell them. 
And as you look at that market and you do that analysis, you might come up with different conclusions. Uh, with poultry, there is the issue of eggs as well as meat. So it's a question of finding what it is that you will be able to sell in the market you live, um, but also how that fits with your own plans of what you want to do. In the system, we found that after the 70, 77 days, we come out with about a six and a half pound live bird that, that processes down to about a 4.2 pound carcass. Um, so that's a good size. The people are getting a, a decent sized bird, yet not too large, too small. Um, so that works in a general direct sale market. Once we did do a, an egg layer flock um, that was about 400 birds, and then we were able to have about 140 dozen eggs a week uh, to sell. So having some you know, a local co-op that was willing to take a vast majority of those enabled us to, to do that as well. So you'll see that there's different distinctions about how you wish to put that into practice. So it's knowing how many birds you can sell, how big you wanna make your flock and your operation, to know who you can sell to, being aware to try to diversify that, looking not just at direct sale, which is very good, but it also takes time. You know, farmers markets uh, take a lot of hours every Saturday. So if you can find someone that wants to buy wholesale or some institution that can buy 100 or 200 at a time, you know, there's some advantage to having them included in your market as well. Knowing what the market wants, whether it's whole birds or pieced birds um, man matters and also knowing what your processor might be able to provide for you in terms of those services. Your pricing needs to be fair, um, both to yourself, you know, that you're making enough from the sale of your birds to be able to cover your costs of production and with some profit above that, but also to make it at a price that it can be accessible to, to other people as you're trying to provide this food in the community. That's, that's another balance against this, but um, People will tend to, to put that limit themselves. <laughs> um, but the issue is, you know, is trying to, to find a price that will work, both in terms of being able to move your birds and being able to yourself live with what you're able to make from their production. But a big piece of this is knowing your story how, and learn, knowing how to sell that, to tell that to people be able to talk to them about the way you raise your birds, about this regenerative story, because that is what people resonate with and want to support. Here locally, we found a lot of support because of the fact that most of our farmers have been immigrant beginning farmers and people have been willing to support them in that effort. Um, but somehow you need to convince people that that cheaper bird in Walmart or the, the grocery store uh, though it might be cheaper, you have other things that you can offer on top of that. The other essential question that has to be addressed is that of, of processing. What access do you have to that in your area? Um, the, and we're lucky to have a family run smaller processor about 80 miles away that's been able to take our birds over all these years. It does provide USDA inspection, so we're able to sell those birds anywhere we wish. Um, there are options for state inspection, at least here in Minnesota, where if you still sell within state lines, that inspection is still valid. Um, there are other options about processing the chickens yourself on your farm. There's some exemptions for those for the number of birds that you process below certain limits, depending on your state. Um, it's somewhat labor intensive, but it, you know, something that certainly can be done. Um, there's equipment that can be, basic equipment that can be found to do that. But the other option is always to go ahead and raise egg layers and sell eggs. Then those 
those processing questions pretty much disappear. I mean, the processing then is to collect and wash and package the birds yourself. A lot of exemptions for how you can do that on farm. Um, but there's, and you also don't have to worry about the transport of the birds to a processor every few months. But again, it's whether your interest is, is in raising meat birds, broilers, or in raising eggs. And those basic decisions are what will form your further decisions about what kind of coop you need and what that might look like. So we'd like to look at a few models for those. Um, this was a design of one of the first ones that we used, essentially built as a um, as a two-part coop. It had a an insulated a smaller section where the chickens were brooded, measured 14 by 40. And that's where the chickens basically were raised during those first three, four weeks of their life. That opened out to a solarium. Uh, there was 30 by 40 on the outside. We have first formulated metal trusses to span that, ex that 30 feet of, of space. But the, the roof was simply plastic sheeting covered with a, uh, a shade cloth. This part had metal siding uh, and metal roofing. This gave additional space for the chickens to first roam and later on as they were coming back in the coop had more room to spread out and sleep at night. But during the colder winter months when there was snow outside and the chickens had to stay in, this provided a space where they could roam during the day. So though the definition of free range gets somewhat more limited, it still certainly provides them as much freedom to move around as possible. Um, we also cut the flocks in half during the winter, you know, to make it you know, less dense and still somewhat of a humane situation. The important thing with any coop is to make sure that you have doors big enough that you can get a tractor in to clean it out. Um, and also those can serve as exit doors for your chickens as well as the others that you have you know, along the front of the solarium here. Um, this gives you a more visual example of what that kind of a coop would look like. Just built with two by sixes, OSB, metal siding, and here with plastic sheeting both on the upper wall and here, corrugated plastic sheeting for the bottom. We found this was a little sturdier um, the chickens couldn't peck through it and also a little harder for other animals to come through. Um, but this, of course, shows up the very initial development of a paddock that um, was before we were quite so concentrated on how we worked with that. Um, the kind of an example of what that looks like. Another example of that is is a post-framed building, much the same size. Uh, the difference here is a cement floor that was put in for the sake of clean out. Um, and also had an, a front area for the solarium. It was built longer and narrower than the, the first building that we looked at. See also that here they, um, they buried tubing could serve as part of a solar collection of heat during the day from the warm air within the solarium, pumped down underground to warm the, the rocks that would then give back that heat during the night and keep the, the building warmer. Um, but all of these types of construction are ones that, you know, with basic skills or I'm sure many of you can do. The other option is also to repurpose buildings that already exist. We have one farmer that used a pole barn, uh, just built a small, simple two by four structure inside with, with plastic covering to keep it a little bit warmer for the brooding stage, but then opened that up more for his chickens afterwards. Um, but these are models that are kind of building from scratch and building with, with purpose. Um, this one intended as a flex coop is said, it could be used also for egg layers 
It's just that there would be nesting boxes that would be built into it as well with a collection alley so that you can collect the eggs. But most of what we say here today is based on the production of broilers. Another option is using perches. This is much more important with the use of hens. We have focused on raising uh, male birds because they tend to grow larger within those 10, 11 weeks that we raise them. Um, the males won't use perches as much, but they do as when they're young. It does help to just decrease the density on the floor and to give them a natural environment because they do like to perch in the trees. Another simpler design was a two by four structure with again, plastic roof and cover and shade cloth, uh, just built on compacted soil. This one was only about $10,000. That first, that last one we looked at was probably closer to 70. So it just depends on what kind of investment you're interested in making in your operation. This one was built by our uh, producers in training and functioned well for five years or so until the farm where we were renting space had other purposes and we needed to move on. Some of the bigger expense here was of course, just pulling up the, the water and electric from the front of the farm back to this. Um, so remember that those are costs that you incur as well. Again, here we used something we call wiggle wire, uh, just aluminum channels with this wire that helps to hold in place the plastic. And I was able, with that, we were able to hold taut both the roof and the sides. Um, started out with a lot of chicken wire on those sides, but ended up with more plywood, just as we find that the chickens needed more protection from storms. But again, that operated pretty well. In this one, we had a water system that was built, the water tank upon a tower. We were able to draw water from a hydrant to fill that. And then that with the low pressure was enough to work the water system within the coop and around the edges of the fence. Um, another model is a, a hoop and canvas structure. We kind of looked at these because of the fact that they're a little bit cheaper and also could be more mobile if they needed to be moved. Um, the thing is that they do not have the same, the same capacity in terms of insulation for more extended season production. Um, but we found that, so on our farm, we actually bumped this up a little bit. Uh, we did put in a cement floor, used ecology blocks to form a base, to give it more stability, used a heavier gauge metal hoop. And this is where we raised our first flock on our farm this year. You can see here that it, it provides a nice clean um, environment. We did not have electricity yet, so still had to work with propane heaters to try to provide the heat for brooding. Um, those because of COVID came a little late, so we did have some struggles, but we think that it's gonna work okay for seasonal production. If it was gonna be more extended, it would need perhaps some internal structure with a little more insulation or, or more heating to, to be able to work. But the chickens did find that they had plenty of room in there and it worked well. We also used it for sheep and possibly in the future for cattle. So that's part of the purpose of beefing it up a bit. Um, another option that many people have opted for are chicken tractors. The idea is that there the chickens are in smaller mobile coops that are moved every day onto new, new grass. Um, this one by John Suskovich and this one developed by the University of Minnesota. Um, we have opted not to use them as tractors with, where the chickens are confined to only this space um, every day, but to look at how we might be able to build some smaller mobile coops as nighttime shelter and move them around to other places up, up on the farm um, to provide a little more option for involving more participants, more producers in training, and to also bring some fertilizer to other places. So that's kind of the um, basics about those coops. An important thing too is to look at uh, your business plan, 
knowing that you have certain skills and passion about what you want to do, but looking at what it will cost, what revenue it'll produce, who's going to do the work, and what are some of the rules you might have to take into consideration, whether those are around food safety or land use. Um, we found that there was a 300 foot rule here away from any waterway, which limited where we could build our coops. Um, and they made it very clear that that was the rule and a coop built closer would be torn down. Also to know where you can find your support, your, your providers for your, the resources that you need and for the processing that you'll have to do. This is just a good recommendation of a website that you might want to, that has a good template to use for business planning, agplan at umn.edu. Um, so I just want to look before we see our time is getting shorter here, um, but to just look at some numbers. You know, they're both the startup expenses of what it means to access land if you do not already have it. There's certain the coop costs certainly vary depending on what you choose to do, but also needing to look at some fencing, some feed bins, a water system, um, some source of heat. Those things all need to be considered. And depending on whether you're building a business that's going to go into this to some size, there may be need for a tractor, transport cages, a trailer, freezer storage and distribution uh, vehicles, some way to, to move your chickens around. So all of that can either be yours or to work if you work in collaboration with others, there might be some sharing of equipment that helps to make that possible. Just to quickly go over a brief budget. This shows the basic expense, unit expenses for the different things involved, the chicks, the feed, <clears throat> the processing and transport and storage, et cetera, costing about $11.85 per chicken, which translates out as you raise 1,000 or 1,500 bird flocks to 12 to $18,000. Um, those are the operating expenses that you would need to have or borrow to have to raise the bird basically from start to finish. Um, but combined with that is revenue. If you're able to sell a bird at $3.49 a pound, realizing that their average weight is about 4.2 pounds, that means $14.66 or $15 revenue for each of those birds. Um, if you take those flocks, if you take that revenue, subtract those costs we had on the previous page, you come out with a profit of about 2300 or 3500, depending on the size you start with. Um, in that prior budget, we had talked about also a line here for labor realizing that that's actually a production cost and something that you can pull out for yourself, whether that be $1,500 or $2,200. So if you add that, um, back in to your profit, then this begins to look a little bit better. But you also have to realize if you've had a loan payment to be able to construct your coop, you might have some payments to make during the year and depending on the number of flocks it'll depend how much they're going to take back away from this but even with say a three thousand dollar a year payment or fifteen hundred a flock you're still going to end up with you know say twenty three hundred forty two hundred profit from each if you do up two three flocks four flocks in a year that can begin to look like some money so the disclaimer is that all of these things can vary. There's so many variables about how many birds die, what the costs of inputs are in a particular year, feed costs and whatnot. As you grow into efficiency, um, it depends what kind of a loan you have, what kind of a loan payment, how well your birds do in terms of growth. So these things are shown as, as an example, not the promise that that's the way it will turn out. So. Um, basically, that is a very quick overview of much information about what this system looks like and can do. 
Tomorrow we're going to be back to talk more about specifics of raising broilers in this system. Talk much more about the chickens from brooding stage to the end. Um, so we do have opportunity there for people to come back and learn more, but hopefully this gives you a base. But we would like to take our remaining time um, so that there is some time for some feedback and questions. Um, so we'll stop sharing this PowerPoint thing if we can. And uh, get back to this. Um, so I will now, if I can, uh, Iraq, if you can help to unmute everyone, uh, if they wish. Um, be able to look at Bob, everyone can unmute themselves in the lower left hand corner so we'd certainly welcome any questions or discussion comments people would like to make and again we'll I will stay on for another 30 minutes, so this can be a more extended time for those who wish to stay, and those who wish can end at any point. But so, floor is open. Hi, Pedro from Mexico. Hello. How are you doing? Good. Good. Uh, I have a question about the, when you establish before the perennials, like the trees or something, mm -hmm. uh, you, you said you put some corn or some flowers. Uh, do like here we have a, like a really marked uh, raining season. So for the dry, for the dry part of the year, you leave the corn stalks standing for the birds to have some cover. You could, because um, we do it not so much for production, it's more for the protection for the chickens. Um, one of the real challenges is, is timing it according to when the, where the flocks are, because you need to have a time window where those sprouts can grow. Uh, so that the corn is you know, a couple of feet high before the chickens get to it, otherwise they'll just chew it down and destroy it. But yeah, you can leave the corn standing um, it works better when it's not dry, but um, it doesn't hurt that it stays there. Okay. And, and about the pasture, it, uh, I've read that it's better if the grass is not so, so high? Yes. Um, once the grass gets tough, you know, the chickens really don't benefit from eating it. They'll trample it down or um, somehow they'll scratch it away but they're really not eating it for food so it's better to deal with with fresh sprouts that are relatively small um, that's where the chickens get the most nutritional value okay and, and another question about the rotation you said it was like four four moves per, uh, per the life cycle of the flock yeah they're out there for six weeks um, so you'd move them, the first one when they're smaller, there's not that much pressure on the, the paddock. So they stay there a little bit longer, but toward the end, uh, about a week is as long as, as they need before they've done some pretty good damage. So then you can move them back. We are finding now with bigger paddocks, there actually is a lot of room out there. So as long as we keep moving them toward the back and spread them around, that, that pressure is less, but yeah, there'll be several times that you do need to return them, but it also depends on how much time it takes for that re-sprouting and regeneration to happen on the other paddock. Um, if here we get a lot of rain, so it's, it's, they sprout pretty well, but in a drier climate, you know, it may take time for that regeneration to happen. So it um, just depends on, on your environment, just how you might be able to manage that. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah.
See, there's a question here about startup costs and for layers and land requirements. Um, for the layers, it's, it's, again, you would need a coop depending on your climate. Here we need one where they're able to overwinter because the, they're pretty productive for those first two years. It takes about six months for them to grow to the point where they start laying. So either you can buy them as pullets is ready at that point, ready to lay, or you buy them as chicks as cost differences in that. But the coop needs to be, um, again, with enough space for them to be inside during that time. You need to have kind of extra room for those nesting boxes and whatnot. So startup costs for them might be I think the coop we built was about $40,000 for 400 chickens. Um, so it does take a little bit, but we also had some other uh, you know, processing space and some, uh, an area for some other experiments on that building. So it wouldn't take that much necessarily to build. But um, yeah, there's some costs involved there. The land requirements, Sometimes we say you need to double the space because the hens are much more active than the, the roosters in terms of moving around. But um, again, we're finding that these paddocks are sufficiently sized. So depending on the number of birds that you have, you know, somewhere between probably 40 and uh, 80 square feet that they would need per bird. So a little bit bigger. So there was a question, I don't know, Rocky, if you've answered these, but yes, this has been recorded. Um, we'll figure out how we can make that available. But we also do have some resources in terms of a chicken production manual that we can make available to people. Um, and are certainly available for any questions that people want to address to us afterwards. You could either send them just to info at mainstreetproject.org or to me, bkell, B-K-E-L-L, -L, at mainstreetproject.org, and we would be able to get back to you. Um, we do have some other resources, and we're trying to get, get those online accessible to people, um, realizing that we used to do a lot of this in-person training locally, but with COVID, we're trying to learn to do it different. And we know also there's interest from many more places. So. Rocky or Bob, could you put the um, email addresses in the chat so people could copy it if they wanted? Yeah, I'm doing that now. Oh, okay, thank thanks. you. I'd just like to introduce Rocky and Heidi, who are part of our staff as well. Heidi's our director, and Rocky works with communications and our land share and a lot of other things. So. Bob, was there a coop design that you liked using better than the others? I did find that that, um, that first one with the, the solarium attached and the insulated section, that, that seemed to give us a lot of flexibility in terms of colder weather to be able to raise chickens. Um, you know, it did cost a bit more to build initially but, but really it became an environment that could be used almost year round and depending where people are, certainly could be. Um, so I think it's, um, yeah, that one's worked well. Some of the others, I think that you have a, a less expensive coop that you say you have two less expensive coops that you run in the summer, you could still easily do four, four flocks of birds. Um, and may not be investing as much in, in the building that you're building. So, uh, so there, it also takes a little more land and it takes a little more development work in that paddock and whatnot, but it just depends where people wanna start and how long they want, how deeply they wanna get into production. I 
at the mobile groups, we're just, I see Sharon asked a question about that. We're trying to, um, we're just trying those out this year. We've, uh, it does seem that from people's experience that they do provide enough protection from predators, which is always a concern. Um, they would not work, I don't think, very well as a brooding space. The chickens need to have a little more enclosed and heatable space for that. But once they get out to the paddock, I think they can work well. So we will try to design a few that are, you know, say for 125 birds each um, or something. So it depends on what size people are looking at for their flock, but they could work. Uh, I see Pedro, you asked how long it takes for them to reach harvest weight. And we're finding that in, um, we're stopping off and now at 10 weeks, we're able to get them to the size we want. Um, they do say, you know, up to 84 days would be, at that point they do kind of level off and they're eating a lot, but not growing very much. You get them to that, then you're often over five pounds with um, processed weight. And they'll be seven and a half live probably. Uh, so we've stopped short of that, finding that it, the, the growth rate does tend to slow and they start to plateau. So, but you know, around 70, 77 days, you can get a good, a four pound plus bird, which is a good size for eating. Hey, I, I had a question and I, I'm the guy who arrived like an hour late, but I've encountered this idea, fascinated by it. One, I understand like being under the canopy is a key uh, attribute of this system. And that seems if we're growing hazelnuts or whatever, like um, would take a long time to establish. And so I, again, I maybe missed this, but can you tell me how important it is that this system is shaded and is under a canopy of something? Um, and should I be putting it in an open space or just in an old apple orchard? If, uh, if I have an old apple orchard and no hazelnuts of any significance right now. The apple orchards would work fine, I think. The issue is, what we find is there's a lot of overhead predators. And so for the chickens, when they have a space where they feel safe, that yeah. they're more apt to stay out on the paddock and continue to eat and scratch and find bugs and spend their day out there. If if it's an open space, a sunny day, they see any movement in the sky, they get very scared and they all scatter back inside the coop. So, okay. um, so that's one thing. The other is that it can potentially be another source of revenue for the producer once the nuts are established and become on another harvest. But it also helps to cool the ground so that the sprouting mm -hmm. uh, happens. And it also helps to process the, the chicken manure, the nitrates from that so that it doesn't get into the groundwater and whatnot. Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of reasons that we've moved that way. Um, but as far as whether you can grow a chicken on a different kind of space, certainly you can. Um, sure, yeah. We find that this is, has some advantages, both for the chicken and uh, for the producer and for the land to do it. And do, like, I picture getting bare root, like hazelnut seedlings from, I'm in Vernon County, Wisconsin, so from the county. But can you, the chicken, leave those alone or do I need to like, do they no, need to be of a certain size? Yeah, we'd let them grow to about two years where they're um, you know, maybe perhaps three feet tall. Yeah. The chickens, they'll still bother the ones that are closest to the coop. The ones that are a little farther away, they won't. Some of them we initially would fence in with a round fence just to give them a little more protection yeah. initially. But yeah, there's a lot of chicken pressure on on those is that chew off the leaves and mm -hmm. slow it down. But, okay, uh, we have reached four o'clock. So you know, those who wish Pedro to- Pedro had one question in the chat. Sorry, one more question from Pedro. Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, I'll be on here for another half hour. So if people wish to stay and have oh. questions, that's, we're available for that. Uh, but just to let people we just wanted to kind of set an hour for people to dedicate to this if they want to go. We hope you come back tomorrow, tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock here. I don't know what time it is where you are. Uh, we'll have another 
presentation more on the production of chickens and have a lot more detail about raising the flock. So if those who wish to welcome you back tomorrow. Um, so Pedro, your question about the breed. We use a breed that's called the Freedom Ranger. It's from the Freedom Ranger hatchery out in Pennsylvania. Uh, originally has a, a French patent on the genetics. The reason we use it is that it ranges very well in the paddock. So for our system, it works excellent. Um, have a good taste, they grow well. It's, it's slow growth, so it, it is this longer time. Cornish broilers are much quicker to reach harvest weight, but again, they don't like to walk. So they'll step outside the coop, go for about 10 feet and sit down. So all this work with the paddock doesn't make any sense if we're gonna have Cornish. Um, so that's the breed that, that we found works very well within this system. As far as access of it, we actually get our birds from Pennsylvania for others. I know that now there are some other hatcheries that do have that license as well. I know there's one in Iowa that does. Um, so I don't know about the rest of the country, how just how accessible those are, but there certainly are other breeds to look at that, that might work well for free ranging. And for egg layers, we used Rhode Island Reds, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And those within the system, we got um, almost about 75, 80% productivity for quite a few months. I mean, they stayed, um, get a lot of, most of those chickens would lay an, an egg a day. So we had, you know, during that high productivity time, which lasted about a year and a half. I mean, they really didn't, decline a lot from that. So good consistency there. Yeah, for layers, to repeat that, yeah, Rocky mentioned Rhode Island Reds was uh, or some version of that was what was used in our experiment with the egg layers. Another question. Yeah. Uh, you have a, a center in San Miguel de Allende, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you know which trees they're using over there? I do not. Um, there was one of our other people that was with us that was more involved with San Miguel. Um, but I'm sure they would be willing to share with you a lot of information about what they're doing there. Um, if they went in for the egg layers, they've done some good development around that, but I'm not sure what they're using for the, the perennials. I know others have talked about using um, even avocado trees in, down there, um, but I'm not sure what they're, they're using. Okay. And, and about, the, about the water consumption, and like how many how many gallons do a flock of the fifteen hundred uh, consume? We haven't tracked that real well because we've always had plenty of access to water through through our well. Um, but they do they do drink a lot of water. Um, at one point we had a tank that was I think three hundred and fifty gallons, and they would go through that. You know, perhaps about every 10 days maybe. Um, so there's, yes, but it depends on the weather, but if it's hot and dry, they will drink a lot of water. We've used automatic systems that are able to, um, as they drink, they replenish. So the birds have been able and have always access to fresh water, but um, so I'm not sure exactly, but I know that yeah, it's a significant amount of water that would need to be provided to them. So if you don't have a well, it would be hauling water out to fill that tank so that it's available um, perhaps once a week or, or something, but depends on the size again of your tank. Okay. You said 350 gallons for I 10 days? So. About, 
Yeah, when they get a little bit bigger, I think they go through about that. Okay. I'm sure there's someone has a little better research about what those that amount of water really is. Good. Check yeah, the I've seen where it's more like for the intensive, like the information there is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I suppose more movement, more water, or maybe. Yeah. So our model is kind of farming of the middle where there's or a lot bigger than, you know, somebody wants to raise 50 chickens, but a lot smaller than those that have 300 or have 30,000 in a coop, you know, so. And for the, the feed, do you buy commercial feed or you make your own? We do buy, um, we buy non-GMO feed that's basically corn and soy with an additive uh, called I think it's avian 100 that has some extra minerals and, and vitamins for them but we don't use any antibiotics um, we opted for the non-gmo rather than organic mostly for price reasons uh, to be able to keep our bird at a market price that was more affordable to more people we find that the organic feed is about 10, 12 cents more per pound. Um, and so when you, the chickens eat about, you know, about 16 pounds of feed you know, during their life. So you know, that can add another you know, $1.60 to the price of raising that bird. And I think it's added to your price on the sale end, but, um, but at least the non-GMO, we felt that we're getting some of the values that we want to, to support. Um, this is not genetically modified, but yeah, if people want to, there is a certainly a market for organic birds. So if people want to go to that feed, you know, if your market will su support it, it's another option. Yeah. Well, I don't think you can get the organic here in Mexico so easy. For... Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> we do have some information also in, in Spanish, Pedro. We've uh, worked a lot here with the Latino community. And so some of our resources would be available in Spanish as well, if, if that's of interest. Oh, thank you. And, and about the, the winter months, uh, the, the, the chickens gain weight much slower? Uh, yes, here, I mean, here we get below zero. So it's, uh, it's a challenge. They're using a lot of energy to stay warm. Also, they do not have access. There's nothing growing out in the paddock for us during the winter. So there's no additional things for them to eat. Um, so it is, yeah, that energy is used to kind of stay warm. So they do grow slower during that time. Of course, it depends down there, the winter, I'm not sure how how challenging that would be for them, they probably would still do pretty well. Yeah, here it's like minus two, but uh, centigrade. So. Yeah. It's not, not as cold. Yeah. yeah. Once they're feathered out, they manage very well with colder weather. That's not a big challenge. It's more for very cold weather that could give them frostbite. Uh, they can be kind of injured on their, their comb or their, um, you know, so it's a little harder on, on them, but as long as it doesn't get super cold, you know, their feathers and the fact that there are many of them together, they provide a lot of heat. We actually raised that flock of egg layers in the winter had very little supplemental heat that we added because of the, just the body heat of the flock kept them warm enough. And the, uh, about the, the learning curve, like some, uh, some things we have to watch out that you recommend us? Um, I think it's, uh, we often suggest to people that they start with the flock a bit smaller than the 1500, you know. Uh, so a lot of times we limit at that to a thousand birds for people starting. It's simply to uh, kind of get used to the rhythm of, of, of a flock. The, the most challenging part is the brooding. That's when the, 
the birds are most vulnerable. So it's uh, really important to keep, keep that space warm enough. Um, especially here, that's been a challenge for us at times because of the cold weather, we start early spring. So that's one of the challenges. The other is uh, just around predators to make sure that there's good predator control and good observation of what might be happening there to be able to protect the flock because they can do a lot of damage in a short time. Uh, so those would be some of the issues. I think otherwise it's pretty basic in terms of the, you know, the feeding schedule and whatnot. It's more just to be observant of the health of the chicken. And if there's any, um, if by any chance there is a virus or some disease that enters the flock that can be very contagious and spread rapidly. So it's important to isolate any chickens that are noticed to be ill, keep them arrest away from the rest of the birds so that they don't all get sick. Um, and there's some euthanasia, you know, when birds have to be put down so they can, you notice they're not gonna make it in the long run. Um, I think those would be some of the things to be particularly attentive to. The, the last one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in, in the brooding, like between flocks, you have to, to leave some time, some time space because of infections? Some, yes, but not a lot. Um, a week or 10 days is sufficient. We do clean out the coop as soon as we can, if we're gonna have another load uh, and then disinfect everything with water with bleach. You know, sort of clean everything out and then spray it with disinfectant and then let it sit for a few days just to kind of make sure everything is taken care of. But then to put in clean bedding and, and make sure everything, all the equipment also is washed and disinfected, then it doesn't need to be a long time in between, but it does need some good um, cleaning protocols so that there's not infection for a new flock coming in. Okay. Well, maybe we continue tomorrow, but there's more, yeah. more people. No? Well, thanks a lot. Yeah, see you then. Thank you. Bye.